He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Because we know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. Even so, we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith in him and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration, that is, the renewal of the Holy Spirit. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Before we open God's word together, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity to study your word, to be refreshed by the truth of your word, to see how consistent your word is, to see the consistency in language. Uh, confirming what we believe that every word, every form of every word, is breathed out by you. That the word of God is completely and totally from you and not the word of man. Father, help us as we study through the word today to see clarity, to understand the distinctions that are made in your word, that we might come to a clearer, fuller understanding of what it means to be filled by God the Holy Spirit. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This morning we are going to look at another ministry of God the Holy Spirit today, and that is to be filled by the Spirit. What exactly does it mean to be filled by the Spirit? We live in a theological world that for the last 2,000 years has seen any number of different interpretations and ideas and opinions upon what it means to be filled by the Spirit. In the last 200 years, I think some of these have multiplied, but we have to look at what the Scripture says. Uh, we have, as I'll show you, three basic views on this, two of which I would not agree with. One I agree with, and we need to understand why. But one of the reasons that we have this confusion is that you have various phrases that are translated in a similar way. You have people described as being full of the Spirit in Acts or filled with the Spirit. You have our, our passage that talks about being filled, uh, filled with the Spirit in some translations, filled by the Spirit in other translations. And so naturally, when people have uh, translations that offer two different prepositions, and, and then you have these other uh, phrases that you find in Acts and in the Gospels, it's no wonder people can get confused because there just isn't a consistency of translation. Part of that is just the, the limitations of, of the English language and what happens whenever you look at prepositions. So today we're going to be looking at some things in detail. We're going to look at grammar. Anybody who glazes over, I guess I'll have to call on you and have you recite, okay? That's your threat for the morning. I'm not going to do that. I'm just having fun with you this morning. But we have to get into these technicalities. And somebody may say, well, why do you get so technical sometimes? I say, do you have any idea the kinds of questions that I get, answered by, I get asked by people? 90% of them I have to drill down into some kind of detail, because they're those kinds of questions. And I prefer to do it one time here than do it 25 times afterwards. So that's why I get into this kind of a detail. And these are significant issues. In fact, I'll mention one view. And we have had a couple of guest speakers that I know which would probably go along with that view. And uh, some, one of them at least may uh, show up here again. So if you hear that view, you'll know where it's coming from and deal with them in grace if they uh, have, a, have a different different view. 
So this is what we're looking at today. We're coming at this in, uh, from our study in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, where twice we have a reference to God the Holy Spirit. Uh, at the end of the first paragraph, 11 to 18, we have, for through him, that is through Christ, we both, that is both Jew and Gentile, have access, and here's our phrase, by one spirit. And here I have the Greek, it is the preposition in, that is used here, translated as by, uh, in the sense of a instrument or means in 2.22, it is in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God. We are being built together by the Holy Spirit. It's the same phrase, use of the same preposition. But you will find that in English, you have different prepositions, sometimes in, sometimes with, and sometimes by, and, and those actually, if you do the technical work on the English, those overlap in meaning. And the, the Greek preposition in uh, can also have a, a really large meaning, because by the time you get into the koine, that preposition is doing uh, triple duty. I mean, it can be used in place of about four other prepositions. Its meaning was getting to be so broad, and people were using it in place of just about every preposition, that by about the 6th or 7th century, they just got rid of it altogether because it had come to be rather meaningless because once something can mean anything, then it means nothing. So that, that's a problem. So we have to look at that a little bit this morning. Now, what we've done so far is we've looked at the ministries of God, the Holy Spirit, broken them into two categories, one to the world, that is to non-believers, to unbelievers. There is the restraining ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, where he restrains evil in the world. And if you think we have evil in this world, you ain't seen nothing yet. What happens in the tribulation and beyond is beyond anything that Sodom and Gomorrah ever even thought about. Then there's the convicting ministry of God the Holy Spirit for, that we see in our Lord's high priestly prayer in John chapter 16 that he said the Holy Spirit would come and he would convict the world. Once again, that's the object of con his convicting ministry of sin, righteousness, and judgment. All three relate to the work of Christ on the cross because the issue is that they have not believed in him. That's the first one. He convicts them because they have not believed in him. And John 3.18 says that that's the one condition that will guarantee uh, eternal condemnation. They are condemned because they have not believed in him. Now, at the time of salvation, I have listed six things that happen. We have regeneration. We have baptism the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the sealing by the Holy Spirit. Now, this morning, the filling by means of the Holy Spirit. And then next time, we'll look at illumination, one of the also confused. It's amazing how much confusion there is, is out there. So we're covering that topic, the ministries of God, the Holy Spirit, today at Salvation. And what the Bible teaches about the indwelling of the Spirit was what we looked at last time. So we have our chart. The left circle indicates that eternal positional reality that we have in Christ. We enter into union with Christ through the baptism by means of God the Holy Spirit. And at that time, we as church age believers are permanently indwelt by God the Holy Spirit. This is one reason that we are not never commanded to be indwelt by the Spirit. It's automatic. We're never commanded to be baptized by God the Holy Spirit either because it's automatic for every church age believer. And we saw that uh, we went through this last time. We looked at the indwelling of God before the church age, that you go back to God's indwelling presence on the earth in the Garden of Eden and then he stays on the earth. There's no indication that he leaves, but he has fortified and protected the garden by an army of cherubs. And then when you come to Genesis 6-3, he says, I will not abide. Now, some translations are doing that now. 
It's a word that only occurs in the Hebrew, and the word that you're usually used to hearing is, uh, my spirit will not dwell, I mean, will not strive with man. But cognate studies show that this word has the meaning of abide and not the meaning of striving. So th then God leaves. You have the judgment of the flood, and then God does not return until the tabernacle is anointed and he descends in the Shekinah, a word that means presence, the indwelling presence of God in the temple. He is there until Ezekiel sees the, in his vision that the dwelling presence of God departs Israel. And then again, there is judgment, and that judgment uh, is uh, on Israel for their disobedience in AD 70 and the temple is destroyed. Notice God's presence is there until, and, until he leaves. And then when he leaves, it's followed by judgment. That's the pattern at the flood. That's the pattern in 586. And then you have his presence comes back in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in whom the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelt. So he is God. He is present. He came into this earth, and he, the scripture says, he dwelt among us and actually uses a word that some translations will say he tabernacled among us. And his presence is here until he ascends after, the, after 40 days, after the resurrection, he ascends to heaven, but then he sends the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit comes and he baptizes all church age believers who are indwelt by God the Holy Spirit. And that, it, that indwelling occurs up until we come to the rapture. And then this is when uh, the church is removed. It is God the Holy Spirit who is indwelling all of the church. That's what we've seen in Ephesians 2 chapter. Uh, in Ephesians 2, in both of those verses we looked at earlier, he, uh, he is removed. He's the restrainer. He's removed. And then literally all hell breaks loose in the tribulation. And there will not be the presence of God or the presence of the Holy Spirit with believers during the tribulation period. And then Jesus Christ will return to establish his presence on the earth, ruling from Jerusalem, where a new temple is built for his dwelling for the, during the tribulation period. I mean, during the millennial period, and then at the end of those thousand years when Satan is released, he will deceive the nations, and those who are numbered like the sea, sand of the seashore will rebel against the perfect administration of the Lord Jesus Christ. God will destroy them immediately. They will be incinerated by brimstone and fire. Then that, this earth and heavens will be uh, destroyed, and God will create a new heavens and new earth, and He, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, will dwell in the new Jerusalem. They will be the source of light for the world, and there will not be a, set, a distinct uh, uh, temple because God will be dwelling among us, uh, but not in a distinct temple. So that gives you the panorama of the dwelling of God uh, on the earth. So the definition for indwelling today is that God the Holy Spirit at the instant of salvation takes up residence in every believer. His purpose is to make both the church as a whole, and that includes every believer from the day of Pentecost until the rapture, living and dead. His purpose is to make both the church as a whole and the individual believer a temple for the indwelling of God the Father and God the Son. So then we looked at being sealed by the Spirit, which also takes place instantly with salvation. Ephesians 1.13 was our passage there, in whom, when you believed, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Again, it is an instrumental use of uh, by the Holy Spirit. He's the means of the sealing, Ephesians 1.13. So that the definition is the seal by the Spirit is the down payment that certifies God's ownership and protection, which secures the salvation of the church age believer from the moment of faith when the Holy Spirit indwells until ultimate salvation in glorification is realized. So it's our down payment. We'll get the rest of it when we're face to face with the Lord. That's Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. 
Okay, now we're going to look at being filled by the Holy Spirit. What in the world does this mean? Well, our central passage is here in Ephesians 5.18. And do not be drunk with wine, that's the negative command, in which is dissipation, but be filled, and the New King James translates it, be filled with the Spirit. That preposition with to many people indicates that the Spirit is the content of the filling, that you're going to be filled, you're going to get more of the Holy Spirit. Another problem we run into, which we'll have to look at, is that if you read some uh, older dispensationalists, like Ch Chafer, like Walverd, like many who went to, to Dallas Seminary in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, they will say that there are the difference between indwelling is that it is permanent and the filling because there are multiple fillings. Now they are correct, there are multiple fillings. There are multiple fillings every hour for most of us, okay? But, that, but then when you, you look at the passages that they go to, it's not, they're not using the same verb that is used here, and it's not talking about the same thing. They're just wrong. They didn't do their homework in the Greek. Actually, Chafer didn't know didn't know uh, the original languages. Walver did, but he, like a lot of theologians, they're not necessarily good exegetes. So we have to look at these issues. So what we see here is that in the translations, some translations translate it using the word with. For example, the NASB, the English Standard Version, the ESV, and the New International, I like to call it a commentary because it's more interpretive than it is just translation. Uh, all, all three translate this using the English preposition with. You can use the word, fill my cup with coffee. You're talking about what's going into the cup. cup. And that's the idea of content. The problem with this, the basic and most significant problem with this, is that Greek is a little more precise than English, and when the writer is talking about filling something with content, what the content is, he uses the verb plus a genitive noun. The noun of the content is in the gen genitive case. That's not what you have here, so it can't be talking about content. You have the preposition in with the dative or instrumental or dative of instrument or dative of means. And that indicates the means by which we are filled, but it doesn't tell us what we're filled with. It doesn't talk about the content in this passage. Now, there are other translations that translate it as means. They use the English preposition by. For example, the NET, uh, I don't recommend the NET because I don't agree with, all, they, they did a lot of interpret, interpretive stuff there in places and in their footnotes. That it's very confusing for people, I think, at times. Um, but it's correct here, by the Spirit, and Ephesians, that should be Ephesians 5, 19, do not get drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but be filled by the Spirit. Ephesians 5.19 with the uh, Holman Christian Study Bible. So here's the phrase in pneumaty. Pneuma means wind or breath, lowercase s, spirit, or uppercase s, spirit for Holy Spirit. So when we look at these, at, at the fact that there are three different views for translating this, we have to look at usage. We have to get a little technical because the scriptures tell us how we should translate things by comparing scripture with scripture. You don't just go to the dictionary and say, oh, look at this. It means spirit, capital S. No, it means wind, it means breath, it means lowercase spirit, like the human spirit, uppercase spirit, holy spirit. And uh, when we look at some passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it uses at least three of them. So you have to understand that all words have a range of meaning. English does too. And when you hear different words in different contexts, your brain automatically filters the context and you know exactly what somebody's talking about, at least hopefully. 
So what do we have to do? Well, we have to look at how this word is used. And the first thing to do is to look at how the, the author uses this word, any word, in the particular epistle or letter that they're writing. So we have pneuma in Ephesians. Now, one of the issues is that there are, there's a minority view. That's the first view we'll look at. There's a minority view that says that this should be translated lowercase s and that we are to be filled in our human spirit. That's their, that's their view. Uh, we'll talk about that later. The other two views translated as the Holy Spirit with a capital S, but one is means, which is our view, and the other is content. So let's look at this. It's used 14 times in Ephesians. Twelve of them refer to the Holy Spirit. Now that's important to understand. It refers to the Holy Spirit. There's only two times when it doesn't refer to the Holy Spirit. One time it's very clear that it's talking about uh, demons or Satan. The one who's the, the, the spirit of disobedience, or talk, talking about an attitude. So we have these various phrases. We're sealed by means of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 1.13. In Ephesians 2.18, we both have access by one spirit. It's the instrumental use of in. In Ephesians 2.22, these are the two verses we started with. We're built together by means of the Holy Spirit for a dwelling place. In Ephesians 3.5, it says, now revealed by the Spirit. So again, it's instrument. The Holy Spirit is the one who's used to, for revelation. Ephesians 3.16 says, to be strengthened with might, through the Spirit. Now here it's a different preposition. But dia with the genitive is the same as in with the dative. It's instrument or means, it means through. And that's how it's translated. So it's through the Spirit. And Ephesians 4.3, uh, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. There it is of the Spirit uh, and its source in the bond of peace. It's not talking about means there, but it's the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.4, 4, there's one body and one spirit, Holy Spirit. Uh, Ephesians 4.23, here's a difference. It's pneuma, but it is the spirit of your mind. That's talking about your attitude, how you think, that you are to be remo- renewed in your thinking, basically. But you understand what spirit is here because it's qualified by the phrase of your mind. In other places, you'll have the Spirit of God. Same thing. You know that Numa there is talking about the Holy Spirit because it's qualified by the phrase of God. Now, our, the uh, conclusion is that of the 14 uses of Numa in uh, Ephesians, 12 of them refer to the third person of the Trinity. One refers to Satan or a demon. One refers to the spirit of the mind. So to come in to Ephesians 5.18 and say this should be the human spirit and not the Holy Spirit runs against the primary usage of the term pneuma in, uh, in Ephesians. Not only that, but it is in pneumity, and that phrase always refers to God the Holy Spirit in not only in Ephesians, but also through most of the rest of the New Testament. So when we come to looking at this, this first view, uh, that the idea that this should be translated as human spirit, it, it runs afoul. Now, I have uh, one dissertation that is quite well researched and studied that takes the human spirit view, and I have looked at it, but it misses some of these points. And that's what you have to do is you have to do your research and read the guys who take alternate positions and figure out, well, did I miss something or did they miss something? Now, the second view is a view that is often misunderstood by people in our camp, in our milieu. Uh, This is a view that was taken um, by Campus Crusade for Christ. And there are people who, people in this congregation who spend a lot of time in college going to Campus Crusade. And this was their view that what you're filled with is the Holy Spirit. And you'll hear people pray, Father, give me more of the Spirit. That's just, that, that's just wrong. It borders on heresy. It's denying the fact that God's already given us 
all of the Holy Spirit, and we're not going to get any more because there's no more to, to get. And so you often hear these, these phrases, and you hear them in some hymns. There's some really poor hymns based on poor understanding of the Holy Spirit. And this is a very dominant position that we're filled with the content of the Spirit. That is, that this believer gets more and more of the Holy Spirit as they grow. But this, as I said earlier, this is normally expressed in grammar with a genitive case. This isn't a genitive case of spirit. It's in, it's in the uh, dative or instrumental. And so that is, that is fallacious. Another way in which people will talk about this sometimes is that they will make a contrast with the first part of the verse, do not be drunk with wine. So they get content from somebody drinking uh, drinking wine. Uh, but I think that uh, they miss the point there. We, we're 2,000 years removed from the mystery religions that dominated in the ancient world. And although the primary uh, uh, temple in Ephesus was the temple to Ar uh, Artemis, Artemis of the Ephesians, and she is equivalent to Diana the Huntress, and so it was calmer than the worship of Dionysius. Dionysius was still pro very prominent in the area we call today Turkey, Asia Minor, and Ephesus. And in the, in the Dionysian worship, the way to get close to Dionysius was to just get drunk, just to get blitzed out of your mind, because Dionysius is the god of wine. And so if you drink enough wine, then the god will enter into you, and you will speak in glossolalic utterance with the god. That explains some things about tongues as well. This was a pagan way of becoming spiritual, becoming one with the god. You went out, and you would have these orgies, and you would get drunk, and the spirit of this God would enter into you. So that, that's really the contrast here, is how do you get close to God? Well, if you're a Dionysian worship, you get close to God, and God uh, fills you up by getting drunk. In contrast, the believer is to be filled by means of the Holy Spirit of God, not Dionysius or some other uh, pagan deity. And that takes us to this, this third view. This third view, this is our passage. When we look at the, con uh, the context of Ephesians, we have uh, four of the five times that we have this phrase, it is, it is used with this instrumental idea. The one time it's used with content, it's clearly with the genitive case. So this takes us to understanding the third view. In the third view, we should translate this that we are filled by means of the Holy Spirit. He is an, the instrument that God uses, that Christ uses, actually, if we look at it in context with the way play, the verb is used in Ephesians. Uh, he fills us with something, and it doesn't tell us what it is here. But we can find it out, and we will before we're done. We're filled by means of the Holy Spirit, and that this indicates the Spirit is used to fill us up with something. Now, how do we figure this out? Because there are people who will take this different ways. And the key thing is you've got to go through usage. And so I went through all of the 37 uses of the phrase in, in looking at every verse and looking at every, the context of these 37. And in 37... There's two times when it's used of someone who's filled with an unclean spirit. And this is a descriptive phrase, and there's not really a parallel to that in any other uses. So I think that was a rather idiomatic way, and it only occurs in one gospel. We see this instrumental use in all of the baptism statements. Remember, we've looked at Matthew 3.11 where John the Baptist says, I baptize you, using the preposition in and the word for water, 
in the dative case. I baptize you by means of water. John is using water to identify the repentant believer with the coming kingdom. That's the idea. And in the parallel, the first part of that verse is, I baptize you with water, but the one who comes after me, he will baptize you in pneumaty by means of the Holy Spirit. So it, it's clearly understood in, in those passages. So we start looking at, I've just picked a few. I'm not going to go through all 37 of them, but these are all helpful to our understanding of the spiritual life. John 4, 23 to 24 is when Jesus is talking to the uh, Samaritan woman by the well of Jacob in, in Samaria. And he says, a time is coming when we will worship by means of the Spirit and by means of truth. Not in the Spirit location. Now that's possible, but to me that has never really made a lot of sense. It sounds a kind of mystical. How do we, are we in the Spirit or out of the Spirit? It's better by means of the Spirit. Are we walking by means of the Spirit? And then Romans 15, 16 is translated uh, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. You just can't make that lo location. You can't say it's locked in, say sanctified in the Holy Spirit. It's sanctified by the Holy Spirit. He's the one who sets it apart. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. This is a passage beginning to deal with the spiritual gifts. Paul says, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by means of the Spirit of God called Jesus accursed. Now you might be able to do that if you're speaking by the flesh, by means of the flesh. See, that's that contrast in Galatians 5. But if you're in fellowship, that's what Paul is saying, is if you're in fellowship and you're walking by the Holy Spirit, you're not going to curse Jesus. But if you're out of fellowship, you can do just about anything that an unbeliever can do and maybe do it better or do it more intensely because you're in the spiritual warfare. 2 Corinthians 6.6 6 again says, By purity, by knowledge, see, all of these are translated as as instrument, by means of purity, by means of knowledge, by means of long-suffering, by means of kindness, by means of the Holy Spirit. So all of those are using the same phrase in the Greek, all translated uh, as, as an in instrument, as the means to accomplish something. Uh, 1 Peter 1.12 says, To them it was revealed that not to themselves... But to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by means of the Holy Spirit. Makes perfect sense. That's how it's translated in the New King James and most other translations. Jude 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying by means of the Holy Spirit. So you can pray not by the Holy Spirit, and then your prayer doesn't go any higher than the ceiling but praying by the Holy Spirit. Now, a couple of places that don't use the preposition, but the idea is communicated just by the dative case. And this is in Galatians 5.16. Again, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5, these are some of the most important passages for understanding the spiritual life. Paul writes, I say then, walk by means of the Spirit. Walk in this, uh, it's, it's a, just a dative case. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then two verses later he says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And in 525 he says, if we live by means of the Spirit and let us also walk by means of the Spirit. See, it's translated as in the Spirit here, the Writer, the translator, isn't consistent. That gets so confusing for Christians because you think it's something different in the Greek, but it's the same phrase all the way through. So this is the idea here, that, that in pneumaty, the ver what we find in Ephesians 5.18, is talking about the means for the filling. Now, now we have to figure out what this filling thing means. 
Okay, that's the other thing, because you have all this language in Acts. They're full of the spirit and truth. They're full of wisdom. And then you get the fun ones. They're full of anger. They're full of wrath. They're full of bitterness. But they're exact same grammatical construction. And all of those examples I just quoted all use the same verb for full or the adjective. But it's not related to the word here. The word we have here in Ephesians 5.18 is this word, plerao, and it means to fill something, to complete something, to fill something up. It is frequently used in the Gospels when talking about something in the Old Testament now being fulfilled. It's brought to completion in Christ's first coming and something that he did. So that's the idea. It is filling something up. It's used sometimes to uh, fill fill up a container with something, but then it's in the genitive because it's talking about content. So here are some notable uses of plerao in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 5, we have the case of Ananias and Sapphira. Remember, Barnabas had, was a wealthy man. He owned some prime real estate in Jerusalem, and he sold it. And he gave all of the money to the church. Now, that is not what we're supposed to do. I mean, I'm, by that I mean it's not a command. It is descriptive. This was his volition. He decided to give all of the proceeds for that land to the church so that they could use it to provide for the needs of the widows and others who were uh, impoverished there in Jerusalem. And that was his decision. And then everybody, of course, they, if they know that somebody has done something like that, they praise them. And so Ananias and, and Sapphira decided they wanted all of that attention. And so they sold the land, some land, but they kept some of the money back, and they only gave some of the money to the church. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. See, the Bible isn't talking about socialism or communism here when the early church held all things in common. It's not talking about the fact that they were communal. It is that everybody understood that everything each one had came ultimately for the Lord and that if anybody else needed anything, then they would be willing to sell or to give whatever they could as God had prospered them to help others. That's the same principle. It's grace. It's an individual decision. Peter and John, the leaders of the church, weren't telling anybody, you have to give this and you have to do that. This is the problem with progressive, progressivism and liberalism, is that what they read into these things is a corporate mandate. There's no command here. Every command related to giving in Scripture is as each person determines ahead of time in their heart, as I quoted this morning. So this is, this is the issue. Now, what happens is, in the early church, God the Holy Spirit is having a heavy-handed discipline to get people's attention. Have you ever noticed that at the beginning of certain dispensations, that there are harsh judgments from God? Now, just think about this. You have the call of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. You get down to Genesis chapter 19, and there is a harsh judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. It's at the beginning of that dispensation. How come God hasn't destroyed San Francisco? How come God hasn't destroyed numerous other uh, cities and places that are completely immersed in all of the perversion of the LGBTQ plus category? Because he only does these things one time at the beginning of, dispensa of a dispensation to authenticate that he's at work in that dispensation. You see the same thing at the beginning of, of the next dispensation, which is the dispensation of, of the law. And the first thing God does is he, this miraculous thing where he brings all of his people, the Jews, out of slavery in, in Egypt. And what marks that? What marks that is these ten plagues that God brings upon the Egyptian people. Now, God doesn't really do anything like that to anybody else over the course of time. We may wish he did, but he doesn't because he only does these kinds of things 
at the beginning of a particular uh, dispensation. So this is the beginning of the church age, and so there's going to be a harsh discipline on Ananias and Sapphira because they have, as Paul, I mean, as Peter puts it here in verse three, they have lied to the Holy Spirit. But the question he asks is, why has Satan filled your heart? Now, Satan is the subject of the verb filled, and the thing that he fills is the innermost thinking of a person, but he didn't he, he isn't the one who is who is filling it. There's a well-known theologian in the Free Grace Camp, now with the Lord and he knows the truth, but he always wanted to argue with Tommy and me and say this is satanic filling of Ananias and Sapphira. But he's the uh, Satan is the subject of the verb, the performer of the action, not the object of the verb. And he is giving, he is filling their mind. This is demon influence. He is influencing them to lie about what they've done. But it's filling your heart with something. Okay? Uh, Acts 5.28, did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? Now this is a situation that, that is also a, a good one to look at because this is the Sadducees and they're in Acts 5, and they're accusing Peter and John. Remember, they'd already arrested them, and they beat them, and they told them, go out and don't, don't do any more preaching or teaching in the name of Jesus. And they went out, and they immediately went into the courtyard of the temple and began to proclaim the gospel and teach about Jesus. And so they get arrested again. And so in their accusation, the Sadducees said, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. This is in the genitive. The content of the filling is their teaching. It's not means, it's content. So the genitive is, is important here. All of this is, 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 is dealing with genitive. Acts 13, 52, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. This isn't means. This is content. It's a genitive for joy and Holy Spirit is genitive. So this is descriptive. This is an idiom. Being filled um, in terms of content with joy, that's describing the person. So when we look at this double accusative here, this du I mean the, the double, um, uh, double object here, with joy and with the Holy Spirit, they both are qualified the same way. So what it's talking about, this is what characterized them. This is what characterized them as joy and, and the Holy Spirit when this happened. It's a description of their character. Now the other word that we have in Acts, also Luke, remember Luke wrote Acts, Luke and Acts, pimplemi, which means to fill, to fulfill, to complete. And many times it can be a synonym for uh, plerao, but it's a different word. And Exegetes have to pay attention. It's, it's not the similarities that are important. It's the differences that are important. In Luke, we have... Just observe what we discover here in the Scripture. Talking about John the Baptist. Gabriel says, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. That Now, from his mother's womb, as we've studied many times, is an idiom for birth. In fact, a number of English translations translate the idiom correctly as from birth. Filled with the Spirit is pimplemi. Has nothing to do with Ephesians 5.18. We get a clear understanding of what Pimplemi does when we look at the next two verses. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was what? Filled with the, with the Spirit. It's Pimplemi. She's filled with the Spirit, and she speaks. That's what I want you to see. She, she's pimplemi leads to some speaking. It's akin to some kind of inspiration or prophetic utterance. Remember, this is before the church age. Luke 1, 67 and 68, this happens now with Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. His father, Zechariah, was filled, pimplemi, with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Note, you go through all of these, they, they, pimplemi is followed by 
some utterance. It's also used sometimes in the, um, uh, with, as a descriptor. So all the, those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, when they heard what Jesus said, were filled with wrath. See, that just is describing, they got mad. It's describing their character. Luke 5, uh, Luke 6, 11, and they were filled with rage. Same, same thing. It's just an idiom describing uh, what, what's going on here. Acts 2, 4, this is with the apostles on the day of Pentecost, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a, 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 a genitive. It's pimplemi, and, it's, and they began to speak. Notice, they pimplemi and they speak. This is not something that happens today. And when you read people like Chafer and Walverd and Ryrie and some others, these are the verses that they'll cite. You know the style you read, and then in parentheses you have five verses, references listed, and you don't look them up. Well, if you looked them up in the Greek, you would discover, well, these are used in different verbs, so where do you get that? Acts 3.10, then they knew it was he who sat begging alms at, the, alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were, notice this is a description of what's going on. They're filled with wonder and amazement. Okay, so what, what's happening here is that they are, um, it's, it's describing them. They are, uh, it, it's, it's a, description, a descriptive term uh, d- giving their characteristics. They're filled with uh, wonder and amazement. And Acts 5.17, then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, this is when they get mad at, um, at Peter and John again, and they're filled with indignation. So this is when it's used this way. It's just describing their character, their attitude at that time. Then we get a Peter, Acts 4.8. Peter pimplemi, filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happens? He speaks. Who knew? Pimplemi is almost always followed. When it's pimplemi with the Holy Spirit, it's almost always followed by speaking something in some prophetic way. Acts 4.31 um, it talks about uh, the believers are gathered, they were all filled with the Spirit, and they spoke. Interesting. They spoke the Word of God with boldness. So we have various positive descriptions of, of the disciples. Uh, you have the list of, of the disciples when they begin, or er, not their proto disciples, not the actual disciples. These are the early church leaders that are chosen in Acts 6 5. They chose Stephen, um, and then they describe him, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. This is using the word pleres, which is an adjectival form of pimplemi. So he's full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. This isn't what you have in Acts, I mean, in, in Ephesians 5.18. It's a totally different word, and it's just describing his character. He's, he's a man who is... Uh, faithful, He's, he trusts the Lord, and uh, the Holy Spirit it characterizes his life. Stephen, oh, excuse me, Stephen, full of faith and power, is again described that way in Acts 6 8. Acts 9 36, we see something a little different. We see the same adjective, full of Dorcas, full of good works and charitable deeds. Now, when we see it there with no mention of the Holy Spirit, what do we see? We see this is just describing the characteristics of her life. It's just an idiomatic way of describing what a person's like. Acts 11, 24 then, he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. He's spiritually mature. That's what that's describing. But it's not the same verb and it's not the same language you have in Ephesians 5.18. So when we get through all of this, What we discover is, let me just give us a conclusion, a couple of things. First of all, pimplemi is a different verb. It's not the same word that's used, and that's the word that is predominantly used in Acts, or its adjectival form of play race. So it's not the same thing. Second, when you find the word pimplemi or play race, it's always with the genitive, which indicates a description of a person, what, what that person's like. Third thing we should notice is none of these is a command. It's just describing their character. They're spiritually mature. 
Only in Acts, excuse me, only in Ephesians 5.18 do we have a command. Be filled by the Holy Spirit. Now, let's look at this passage just a minute to see what comes after it. Ephesians 5.18 says that we are to be filled by the Spirit. What's the result? You have these participles that follow it. These are participles that describe the result of the filling. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, I know some people don't like to sing in church, but you notice one of the first characteristic of somebody who's being filled by the Spirit is that they want to sing praises to God. That's the first thing he lists. It's not the last thing. It's not a footnote. It's not buried in the fifth appendix. It's the first thing he mentions. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Why? Because you're excited and joyful about what God has done. Next thing is giving thanks. Notice how that that next time you read through the first part of Ephesians 5, I think giving thanks to God is mentioned three times, and it is a consequence of walking by the Spirit, being filled by means of the Spirit. So it's, and then submitting to one another in the fear of God. The next section explains that even more. So it doesn't tell us exactly what, what the filling is. But we get a clue in, if, in Colossians 3, 16 and 17. If you look at the second part of 316, it says teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There's a command at the first part of Colossians 3.16, and then there's a list of the results. The results are the same as the results over there in Ephesians 5.19 and following. But the command is different. So if you have command A and you have command B, and the results of both of them are identical, then command A and command B have to go together. You get two sides of the coin. In Ephesians 5, it's be filled by means of the Spirit. But what are you filled with? That's Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you in all wisdom. That's the command. See, if you're not reading your Bible every day, you're not listening to the word of God every day, you're not memorizing scripture and letting that uh, float around in your thinking all day, then the word of Christ is not dwelling richly in you. That's what God the Holy Spirit uses to mature us. He's like a mechanic, and you have two kinds of mechanics. You can go to some little shop, and the guy's got about five tools, and you bring your car in, and it takes him three days because it's hard to do everything with a screwdriver and a wrench and maybe a hammer. But the guy down the street has all the whiz-bang computer stuff, and he can hook it all up, and he has all the latest tools and gadgets, to use in fixing your car, and it's done in an hour. The first person doesn't give the Holy Spirit any tools. This is like the guy who just, oh, I go to Bible class, I go to church once a week, I read my Bible on occasion once a year, and that's it. You're not giving the Holy Spirit any tools to reformat your thinking, to to change your life, to transform you into the image of Christ. But the person who is reading the Bible daily and memorizing Scripture and coming to Bible class or listening online five, six, seven times a week, then that person is giving the Holy Spirit a whole lot of tools to use in their life to change it. The result is that they are walking by the Spirit. The result of walking by the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit, transformed character. And the person who is walking by the Spirit and exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit is one of those people like Stephen and others that are mentioned in Acts who are full of the Spirit and wisdom, full of faith in the Spirit. They are the ones who are maturing and growing and uh, learning the Word of God to apply the Word of God. So this is what it means to be filled by the Spirit, to be in the Word, 
to be walking by the Spirit, which means you have to be in fellowship, and to be reading, studying, thinking about the Word of God, uh, and letting that just saturate your thinking so that God the Holy Spirit can transform your life. Now next time we'll come back and we'll look at the last one, which is the leading of the Spirit. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together to study your word, to gain a greater, more precise understanding of what it means to walk by the Spirit, to be filled by the Spirit, to let your word of God, let your word just saturate our thinking, saturate our souls so that God the Holy Spirit can transform us day by day into the image of Christ. Father, we pray that there may be some who listen to this message and Maybe they're unsure if they're saved. They're uncertain if they will go to heaven when they die. Uh, that's a different issue. That is an issue of trusting in Christ as our Savior. For Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He, there he paid the penalty for our sins. And in Acts it says that he who knew no sin was made sin for us. That the righteousness of God might be found in us. And so, Father, we pray that you would... Uh, work on the minds of those who are unsaved to clarify, illuminate their thinking, that God the Holy Spirit we know will be convicting them of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and that he will be making it clear that they need to trust Christ. Father, we pray that they will. Father, we pray for us that we might not let these words fall to the ground, but that God the Holy Spirit will use them to continue to transform us into the character of Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen.